way better to get your light, uh, what I call the light diet under control. Your light diet is when you see light, what type of light it is and when you when you get it. And, you know, it needs to start in the morning with bright, the bright daylight, get out every day. You know, even if it's rainy, get out. Um, because uh, there's plenty of blue light at that time, even in, a, in an overcast day. Avoid getting excessive light in the evening and certainly uh, get blue, zero blue light or light with, with no blue content in the evening hours. People who sleep with the lights on at night have double the rate of obesity, diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure. Um, so again, sleeping in the dark is critical. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Dr. Martin Moreed, a.k.a. The Light Doctor, on the line. Martin, how's it going? Thanks for joining. Good. Glad to be with you. Ryan, how are you doing today on this early morning? I'm good. I'm excited. Yeah, this is like my bread and butter stuff. I live for this. I go out of my way to get proper light or avoid improper light as much as I can. So this is a very passionate subject for me. So this will be good. Yeah, I think we've had maybe a little bit of discussion um, with, you know, Ryan Carter and other folks about light, but not a whole podcast episode dedicated um, to this topic. So yeah, something obviously you and I practice pretty heavily and learn a lot about. So I'm excited to dive in. Um, Martin, you are the light doctor. You have just released a book called The Light Doctor, and you've released other books in the past on circadian rhythm. You're at Harvard. How did you get into realizing how important circadian health is for our lives and why this, I believe on your website, you know, says Trump's diet, Trump's everything else when it comes to health. So maybe I guess... When did you realize that this was something you wanted to work on for the rest of your life? Well, it really drove, the whole problem drove home to me when I was uh, coming out of medical school and I was going to become a surgeon. Um, and so I got into a surgical residency uh, and I turned up on the job and I found I had a schedule of 36 hours on, on my feet nonstop, 12 hours off, back in for 36 another 12 hours off, 100 and something or other hours a week uh, on that schedule, working under bright fluorescent lights uh, the whole time. And um, I was so screwed up with the um, walking around like a zombie, uh, constant fatigue, malaise, and so forth, uh, doing this. Uh, I was nodding off in the operating room, uh, and it wasn't just me, it was others too. Um, I was writing prescriptions I couldn't make sense of the next day. And I kind of got really interested in this whole issue of the rhythms of the body and the timing of the body, because I found sometimes I was awake a very long time and I couldn't get to sleep. Other times I'd be nodding off asleep in a critical situation. So I said, what's timing this? What's controlling all this? And so I took a detour, uh, as it were, um, uh, and did a PhD at Harvard Medical School on circadian rhythms and, and their mechanisms and circadian clocks. Now, at that time, all the professors I talked to warned me off this subject. This is a dubious subject. Uh, there was no evidence there was even a circadian clock. Um, yeah, there's some rhythms, but they're to do with the Earth's rotation and electromagnetic forces. You know, a young man, stay clear of that. You'll never make your reputation in that area. Um, I was sufficiently strong-headed or whatever to ignore them and go ahead. And as a result, I got a front row seat um, in the research in this field. And at Harvard, uh, when I got my PhD, I was then able to join the faculty and I was able to build a lab and a whole group of very smart postdocs and um, graduate students and fellows and the like. And together, we published a host of papers, a wonderful time, because obviously it was brand new. Um, several things that weren't known at that time, for example, no one thought humans had a biological clock. They thought it was you know, something um, quite different for humans than other animals. Uh, the first clocks were discovered in rats and hamsters. 
That was after I started graduate school. Um, and then, uh, uh, but we set out, we identified where it was in the human brain. It was, in fact, one. And then the other thing that was considered about humans, that they weren't synchronized by light and dark. It was some form of complex social interaction was the prevailing theory at that time. And we were able to set up studies that were able to show actually it was light and dark. So just like other animals, it was light and dark, synchronizing a clock in our brains that controls our circadian rhythms. And in turn, when we screw it up with light at the wrong time, or the wrong type of light at the wrong time, uh, we end up with serious ill health and, and diseases and other problems. So that really got, that's that's the short history of how I got there. And I've been there since. And uh, my career has taken me all the way through from the basic research, from the experience, of course, of being out in that world and working under the, you know, having my own clock screwed up, to discovery doing the basic science, to taking that out into applications, into uh, practical uh, people who work in industry around the clock. Um, and then recognizing uh, that the problem needed to be fixed with better lights inventing um, a new type of, of light, circadian lighting, um, that prevented this disrupted effect. But we can get more into all of that. No, that's, that's I mean, that's that's like, oh man, so, I, I get like really excited about this topic because I think there's just, there's so much there. And it's really fascinating because it's something that, generally speaking, people don't really think about when they think about a uh, sleep-wake cycle. I think most people on some level understand that there is a sleep wake cycle. Like I hear people talk about how messed up their, their sleep um, routines are or whatever. Like I'll hear it all the time, like growing up or in college like that. Tristan has a lot of stories with that one studying really late, lots of coffee, stuff like that to sort of stay awake and uh, put off that adenosine and things like that. But what's really interesting to me is like in the medical space, like you were saying, you were having such, such a difficult time. And at the same time, you needed to be the sharpest you could be in those situations to make the right decisions. And it makes me question, like, in a medical setting, especially like emergency rooms that run 24 hours a day, like, how often are mistakes made by made simply by lack of proper circadian health and how that even in healthcare, there's a lack of health built around our doctors who you would think we need to be the healthiest to make adequate decision making for their patients and stuff like that. And so it, it, it's it's really interesting because it transcends um, everything, in, in my opinion. Um, I, but there are like, aren't there, there are four different biological clocks. Is that correct? No, a whole lot more than that. Um, That's what I'm saying. There's a lot of clocks. There's a lot. So we have, uh, just to run you through it, right? The light is received through the eyes, through special receptors in the eyes, uh, which detect particularly a blue wavelengths. All right, and those are the um, called the uh, they're called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or the I IPRGCs. Those are blue light detectors, um, and we'll get more into why it's blue light and all the rest of it. But those then have a direct pathway to the SCN, to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the master pacemaker that we talked about. But then virtually every cell in the body has um, circadian clocks, kidneys, heart, liver, you name it. And all those clocks need to be, for your good health, to be kept in synchrony with each other. So there are all sorts of hormonal signals and hormonal rhythms, cortisol and growth hormone and others, melatonin in particular, which are sending signals about the time of day to all the cells of the body. When we get ill health, it's when those all those rhythms, all those clocks get out of sync with each other. That's when people immune system starts to fail and people are more vulnerable to illness. That's when your thermoregulation or your body temperature regulation gets out of whack. Uh, that's when, in fact, cancer cells grow more rapidly when there is circadian disruption. So as a result of that, all the diseases associated with light at night, excess light at night, and particularly excess blue-rich light at night, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, are all related to that circadian disruption effect. Um, so the body is sort of set up as a beautifully time machine. It was never a problem until we invented electric light because days were bright and full of blue and nights were dark and very little blue, very little light at all, of course, at night, natural light. And even our 
fire, wood fires of old and our candles have extremely little blue light. So we were, just weren't affected. We didn't have this problem. But then we, of course, invented electric light. But it wasn't just electric light in general. It turns out that it's blue-rich electric light that's a problem, right? And that really didn't happen until about the 1970s or so when fluorescent lights really were widely put in um, in the commercial buildings and offices and all sorts of hospitals everywhere else. And those fluorescent lights, which are rich in blue, resulted in, for example, breast cancer rates quadrupled from 1970 to 2010, right? Just, you know, uh, all sorts of other diseases came along. And now, of course, we've moved into a new era, very significant timing this year because we've just banned incandescents. They're relatively low in blue. We've banned halogen. Many states, um, at least five and counting, um, have banned fluorescence now. So the only thing that you can actually buy is LEDs. And LEDs are engineered with because of their, as part of their energy efficiency with a big blue spike in them. And that blue spike is okay during the day, but at night it is causing havoc. So we're you know, we, we're forcing ourselves as people have to give up their incandescent light bulbs as they give out and they have to can't replace them, can't buy them in the stores. Any store owner who sells you one gets fined, you know, 500 bucks. You know, it's crazy, right? We've shut that down. So we're now in a world where our light is not our friend. And that's why we set out to invent better lights, which are now coming onto the market increasingly um, to solve this problem. And um, and that's that's really the issue. People need to understand, you know, you take light for granted, um, but uh, there are actually a lot of questions you should have before switching on the lights, especially in the evening and at nighttime. Yeah, and I think that's, I want to get into the LEDs and the technology and how lights are kind of made and, and that nuance a bit later. First, I want to stick, you, you made a point that maybe some people would debate is like saying, you know, breast cancer rates have, you know, gone up quadrupled in 40 years, but a lot of other toxins, you know, glyphosate, you know, food has gotten worse, you know, obviously light has gotten worse, technology, EMFs, non-native EMFs, you could argue like, probably a lot of things. Why do you think that light, I guess, would be the main driver? And maybe let's let's give the audience, let's convince the audience why this is so imperative. And to me, I just want to shed an example or highlight an example. It's like when I started diving deeper into melatonin and its functions as a hormone throughout the body, in the mitochondria, in the gut, everywhere, not just the pineal gland, you truly realize how important circadian health was, but maybe you can uh, give a little spiel on just why you think it is the number one thing. Okay, well, let's just go through this. First of all, um, breast cancer was a pretty rare cancer um, uh, right until the middle of last century. It it was really very rare in women. Um, And it is still, and where it is rare today, is in places where women don't see electric light. Number one, there are parts of the world where there's no electric light, uh, and there's no electricity. Significant fractions of of the third world has that. Secondly, women who've been blind since an early age don't get breast cancer, okay? So they've got all the other toxins exposed to, but they don't get light. Thirdly, we know the mechanisms pretty well. They've been really beautifully worked out. I think the most illustrative study was one done by David Blask, Professor Blask at Tulane and his colleagues, um, where they were, they've got um, mice there that have growing human breast cancer on the mice. In other words, they implant uh, breast cancer tumors from humans and they grow them on the mice. When the mice are in the dark, the tumors don't grow and melatonin is being produced by the mouse. The tumors grow very slowly. When you put the lights on, the melatonin is suppressed at night. Um, the tumors grow much faster. All right, number one. Number two, they took women um, in um, in a lab actually up in Baltimore, um, and uh, where they two groups of women. One group of women had the sitting in the in bright light at night, um, and had then had blood samples taken. Another group of women sitting in pitch dark all night. Had blood samples taken. So the ones who were in bright light at night 
had very suppressed, very low levels of melatonin in their blood. The ones who, of course, are in the darkness at night had very high levels of melatonin in their blood. They then shipped that blood down to Tulane and infused it into the rats. And the melatonin-rich blood from women sitting in the dark suppressed those tumor growths in the rats and mice. But the blood that came from the women sitting in the um, light, under bright lights, with low melatonin content, the tumor cells grew rapidly. It's also true that the drugs we use to treat breast cancer don't work as well when melatonin is low and the light is suppressed. So even the drugs don't work so well. And um, so that's all that is part of the whole story. Um, so there's a pretty, pretty convincing story all around. Uh, if we look at the rates, just to put some numbers around it, um, in parts of the world where we don't have electricity or don't have people exposed to light, and that is either today, and as I say, the, the parts of the world that aren't electrified, or if we go back in history to the early 1900s, where Iceland, for example, didn't get any uh, much in the way of electric light uh, until way, way late into about the uh, 1920s or so. And when that happened, um, their light breast cancer rates are very low. As they've electrified the country, the breast cancer rates went up way up. So the rates in the non-electrified part of the world are 20 per 100,000 women per year. The rates in the part of the world where they're highly electrified, that's North America, uh, Western Europe, uh, the rates are like 110 compared to 20 in terms of uh, cases per year, 100,000 women per year. Uh, if we look at the breast cancer rates in American women, uh, it is climbing steadily. So today, 13% of all American women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. And I predict that's going to get worse unless we do something about this, uh, all these LED lights that are flooding our, our lives. And they're flooding our lives from not only, of course, um, light bulbs and light fixtures, but also from the screens uh, we use, um, all of those. And all of that is quite unnecessary. In fact, it's a public health problem. You know, we've got lots of public health problems. We've got toxins. We've got... PFAS, you hear about PFAS, the chemical, the, you know, the, the, the forever chemicals you can't get rid of that are linked to disease. Those are darn difficult to get rid of, right, to change, to clean up the environment. This is simple. Just change the light bulb. It, it is such a simple solution. Um, and uh, that's why we've got to really get out and educate. And that's the reason for writing my book, the Light Doctor, which is on Substack, and you can subscribe for free on Substack, um, for example, and all the chapters are available to you, um, and uh, thousands of people are, are doing that. So that comes out every two weeks, a new chapter every two weeks. So I guess, is the main mechanism then, because of cancer proliferating because melatonin is being suppressed? Is this the main reason or is there more behind that? And is it because melatonin is very anti-cancer and you know, dictating apoptosis and, and things like that and autophagy? Or is there more than just melatonin? Well, melatonin is part of it. And certainly melatonin is a very important suppressor of cancer cells, right? So it's a protective mechanism that naturally in the body, when we're asleep in the dark, it is suppressing any cancer cells that haven't been really lurking in our body. But the more important thing is the circadian disruption, as I talked about, when those clocks get out of in line with each other, that breaks down the body's natural, all sorts of other mechanisms. And that's, that leads to more rapid growth, more. And, and it's not, let's not focus this on a cancer issue. It's not a cancer story. Um, it is an obesity story, a diabetes story, a heart disease story. There's a host of medical conditions uh, that result from this. Uh, it's psychiatric illness, depression. Um, you know, all sorts of things are linked now. And death rates. Uh, the latest study just uh, just came out as a preprint shows that a big study of 88,000 uh, men and women in England, aged in their 60s, were all studied. They all wore devices that detected how much light they were exposed to. They're 24-7. They had these devices that say, how much light are they getting, particularly in the nighttime hours? And then they tracked their survival over the next six years. The people who had the brightest, most light exposure at night 
died 30% faster. The survival rates were 30% less, right? They died faster than the ones who were in the dark conditions at night. Um, that's a huge thing, right? In other words, it's not just the diseases, it's also the end result. So anybody who's concerned about longevity, um, you know, one of the core things you need to do is get exposed to um, absence of blue-rich light at night, but most importantly also presence and exposure to blue-rich light during the day. You know, you one of you are there I see is sitting outside, the, you, um, and um, that Ryan's outside, and you, I guess you're in your garage with sunlight coming in. You know, that's the issue. Getting daylight in the mornings um, uh, is the most critical thing. Um, and I think one of the interesting studies there, just as a, you know, they built this uh, psychiatric hospital in Scandinavia um, with half the rooms were facing east and south. The other half of the rooms were facing north and west. And they were admitting patients with a variety of psychiatric diagnoses, depression, and and, and and all sorts of other conditions into this hospital. And the ones who were admitted to the rooms that got morning sunlight, in other words, facing east and south, were discharged from that psychiatric hospital twice as quickly. Their stays were half as long as those who were admitted into the northwest facing rooms. Same medical treatment, same doctors, everything else. Huge impact, in other words, of getting bright light in the morning. And that bright light in the morning is also a very important part of the combating of the uh, risk of cancer, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, because it is strengthening the synchronization of the circadian rhythms. It's reducing circadian disruption. It makes you more resistant to any light you might see at night. So you need to do both. It's light during the day, absence of blue during the night. Um, you need both as part of this solution. Hey, friend. Thanks for listening. If you really enjoy this podcast, it would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. That's actually a really good point. And that's actually what I was going to bring up too, is because a lot of people, so many things, I, so many ways I go with this, but um, a lot of people talk about proper light during the day, but they they aren't talking enough about having dark, cool, like night nighttime settings for how you prepare for sleep. Like they talk about blue blockers a lot, but a lot of people don't talk about how you have, you know, sensors for these photoreceptors in your skin as well. So it's not just the light that gets into your eyes. It's also the light that gets on your skin and stuff at night and all these various things. So it's kind of nuanced like that. And one thing I was going to mention about melatonin, me and Tristan were sort of going back and forth about this, um, is that I, I think about, very good point, it's not just cancer, it's like all these illnesses. I like that you brought up psychiatric illness because I'm someone that comes from a eating disorder background, a depression background, anxiety, like name them all. Like I've probably been labeled with all of them at some point. And it's really fascinating because I, the one of the sort of commonalities I see in people with these psychiatric illnesses is they're never outside ever, usually on their phones all the time, getting dopamine hits from like Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And they're, they're, they're doing all the things they can do to make the problem systemic or make it worse. And they don't even know. And so that's why I think this education is important because it may not be the entire solution per se, but it's a huge chunk of it is like, you got to get outside. You really got to treat your circadian rhythm with care, because if you don't have it, you don't have anything. And we could even get into things like thyroid disorders and like flashing your thyroid, blue, like your artificial blue light, like directly <laughs> all day long and stuff like that. And people don't really yeah. notice yeah. the nuances in that. Yeah, I would be a little careful. I would say the science is very solid around these receptors in the eye. Um, less solid around those other ideas on the skin. So I would I would tend to focus on the eye ones, uh, the retinal uh, ganglion cells, because they're the main receptors that we've really demonstrated really firmly are providing that signal to the SCN. Um, there is a, There are effects of light on the skin, certainly, um, but it doesn't radiate very deeply in. It depends on the wavelength. And of yeah, course, yeah. there are skin cancers and the like that get result of the, the balance you've got with going outside in sunlight is the risk of skin cancers, particularly as you get older. Um, so it's a, it's a balance. So that's why we recommend, another second reason we recommend going out to get that daily light dose in the mornings 
before the sun reaches its height with zenith, right, um, is there is less of the radiation that's harmful at that time. Um, and so the morning time is particularly effective. And it's also the time that the circadian clock is most sensitive to being set properly. Um, and if you get too much bright light in the evenings, it actually pushes your circadian clock out of whack, whereas the mornings keeps it tight, be synchronized to day and night. Yeah, one one thing I guess I wanted to ask with that, um, sort of back to melatonin, just because I know lots of people, as I'm sure you know lots of people, that supplement with melatonin. And I'd love to know your thoughts on that, how that can maybe be not advantageous for you in the long run. Um, and sort of just your thoughts on melatonin supplementation, because there are lots of people that I know use it because they can't sleep. And they're also not addressing their light environment because they don't know. And so how can that be disruptive or what are your thoughts around that? Well, the problem with melatonin is uh, because it's never been patented, it's a natural substance, that there is nothing like the regulation there is for other medications, right, that have had to go through FDA approval and scientific studies. And the what you buy at the counter, you have to be extremely careful of the dosages are entirely unreliable. You can have, and and the whole thing about melatonin is, you know, people tend to take pharmacological doses which are not healthy. Um, the doses in the body um, are rather less than that, and and the amount of you actually get is very hard to tell because uh, someone did an analysis of the various bottles off the shelves and different products. You know, some contain no melatonin at all. You know, and some contain very large amounts. Um, so it's not a very safe thing to be messing around with, and that's unfortunately because the regulations are very lax and uh, and, and sloppy around melatonin. Melatonin does have a role um, if you're having trouble synchronizing to a schedule. Um, people who have, um, uh, for example, um, blind people, take one example, you know, you can help them keep synchronized because otherwise they tend to drift uh, by using melatonin. Um, so, but it is something you have to be rather careful of and it's uh, not something you can just uh, use and way better to get your light, uh, what I call the light diet, get your light diet under control. Your light diet is when you see light, what type of light it is and when you when you get it. And, you know, it needs to start in the morning with bright the bright daylight, get out every day. You know, even if it's rainy, get out because um, uh, there's plenty of blue light at that time, even in, a, in an overcast day. Um, get out and um, get your uh, avoid getting excessive light in the evening, and certainly uh, get blue zero blue light or light with with no blue content in the evening hours. Make sure you're sleeping in the dark. Um, amazing number of people sleep with the lights on. Uh, particularly those with anxiety. Uh, it, it's, I mean, there have been surveys, you know, um, general population, 30 odd percent, elderly people, 50 percent, right? Sleeping with the lights on at night. People who sleep with the lights on at night have double the rate of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease and high blood pressure. Um, so again, sleeping in the dark is critical. So your light diet needs to be managed. And that's, that's really critical. Yeah, I think the the melatonin supplementation is interesting because yeah, the dosing people don't don't realize. I mean, I used to take it a bunch in college because there's you know college engineering student overwhelmed. But you know, people take five ten milligrams, and I think our body is naturally producing on you know fifty to two hundred micrograms, right? So you're talking, and then the dosing variants you're, you're mentioning because there's no regulations. So to me, it's yeah. It might be, it might have a somewhat of a use case if you're, you know, jumping around time zones. But I, I like to maybe still yield caution for any of these synthetic compounds because, like you said, you just right. you don't know what what's in there. Um, but a, what I wanted to get into and maybe ask are, are some nuances around light. So I think Ryan mentioned a couple of them, but in general, you mentioned earlier that blue light during the day is, you know, is fine. Um, a lot of people in our space, you know, say that, you know, light coming through a glass or light, you know, inside is still absent of, it's not indicative of full spectrum sunlight, which blue light would always be accompanied by, you know, red, infrared in sunlight. 
Is this something that you think is, is important and still can change the way our biology you know, reacts if blue light, even during the day, is in isolation? Yeah, well, let's start defining light properly, all right? Because um, the conversation is this. Um, the light you see from the sun or from daylight or from electric lights is made of a rainbow spectrum of colors. You don't see them with your eyes. What you just see is a yellowish or whitish light, and that's what you see. But that's the mixture, right? You're looking at the mixture. That is made up of the, all the colors of the rainbow. You see those colors, of course, when there's a rainbow in the sky. That's when the, light, the sunlight's falling on rain droplets and they're getting split by, uh, by diffraction. But you also see it when you've got a crystal or a, a, a vase in the house or hit some piece of glass. And then you can see this beautiful color pattern on the wall or on the floor. Um, that's what light contains. And we use a device called a spectrophotometer uh, to measure this. Um, and it's sort of something the size of a, um, uh, essentially like, like an iPhone type size device that you can just point and then it will just show you what all the colors are. Um, now, let's just talk about all those colors. Every one of those colors has a distinct health impact, many beneficial. So starting at the one end of the spectrum, at violet light, violet light, and, and by the way, the light spectrum we measure in nanometers, um, so that basically the visible light is between 380 nanometers in the violet, and it goes all the way up to 780 nanometers in the deep red just before you go into infrared. Um, now, blue is a very loosely used firm. Some people talk about all light between 400 and 500 is blue. And there's a whole, and, and yet there are many parts of that blue spectrum. There's a violet part, there's an indigo part, there's a sky blue part, there's a cyan aqua type part of that. Every one of those has distinctly different effects on health. So you really have to start separating it out. So if we start walking walking our way through the spectrum, at the violet, um, about 405 down in the violet is a very effective at bactericidal. In other words, it kills bacteria. So if you have that in your lights, it's a disinfectant. All right. Now remember, sunlight has all of this. So sunlight has disinfecting light in the violet. Uh, it has light in the uh, royal blue, the indigo royal blue type of light, around 425 to 435 particularly. Uh, and that's light which uh, can have effects in damaging your eyes at extremely bright levels. And people talk about blue hazard. Now, blue hazard is not all blue. It's just one part of that blue spectrum, and it's only when it's very bright. Now, the difference between daylight or sunlight and indoors is huge. Um, naturally, we have a million-fold change between the brightest moonlight and the brightest sunlight, a million-fold in brightness. Indoors, we live in constant twilight. We're a 100 times dimmer um, than uh, daylight or sunlight outside when we're indoors, and a 100 times brighter than moonlight outside when we're indoors. We, so we got ourselves in this, you know, instead of having a million-fold contrast, which keeps our clocks in sync, we've got this steady twilight um, levels of light, uh, which doesn't provide a strong cue. All right, so the, that so if you go outside on a really bright day on a beach and everything else, you could get harm to your eyes from this blue hazard, which is around 425, 435, all right? But it's not never a problem indoors. And that's, that's why wearing blue blocking glasses to protect your eyes indoors is ridiculous because there's not enough light there. You may do it for visual acuity or other reasons, but not, not for protecting your uh, apoptosis of the, uh, of the cells. Go a little higher up now. The range that we're talking about for circadian effects starts at 440 up to 495. The peak is about 480. That's sky blue. So sky blue is the color, interesting color, um, it's a cue. It is the cue that the receptors, those IPRGC receptors in your eyes, are detecting. It's 480 blue. That blue is the only color that will penetrate the ocean depths. In other words, all the other colors of sunlight disappear, absorbed by seawater. So when life began, the only color it ever saw was 480 blue. Right? 
So therefore, all the primitive mechanisms that developed circadian clocks, developed circadian detection systems, developed even a melatonin system down in the ocean in early life back in the Cambrian era, you know, they were operating. It's blue down there during the day and black at night. Go a little further up our spectrum and we get into, um, you know, colors like in, in the greens. Green is a color that we are most sensitive to in terms of brightness. Think about our world outside is very green. That's the color where we have most visual sensitivity, much more the visual sensitivity to, to green than any other color. In fact, how we measure brightness in lumens or lux of a light bulb is we measure the amount of yellow and green it's producing. We don't measure the amount of blue or red. So the, the, what the light bulbs are telling you when they're talking about lumens and lux is only yellow and green. Go a little further up, if we get into the reds now, um, red actually is a healing. Uh, it will he it, it promotes healing, uh, red colors. Uh, it pr will promote hair growth. People have devices on their head. If you're getting a little bald, uh, you stimulate hair growth. That's red. Um, and then, you know, and then, of course, we have the infrared and where photobiomodulation is used and a lot of health things are coming along in that space. Sunlight has all of that and inadequate amounts, in large amounts. So you get a huge health benefit from many parts of the spectrum. You're getting disinfectant, you're getting your clock synchronized, you're getting your pain and your amygdala calm down, you're getting your, um, uh, you're getting your, even maybe some hair growth as you walk along in sunlight, right? So, um, whereas uh, indoors, there's not enough energy in, in, across the spectrum to deliver these biological effects. That's why we have to engineer indoor lights to be healthy. And what do we and, and decide what we're going to need? Uh, we don't need to grow our hair all the time. We can put a little device on our head to do it, right? But you can you don't have to have that red. So that's the thing: is there is a spectrum there. And understanding that the whole of the light spectrum is healthy and it's really healthy outside and indoors, we've got a sort of simulation, as it were, of light, but it's not a natural light. It's very artificial. And unfortunately, we've built our lights like the LED lights today with a blue pump at around 450, um, with a gap in the a gap around the point where we want circadian, most best circadian effect. Um, uh, and we built unhealthy lights, and we've done it just to maximize the energy, and maximize the energy by measured by lumens per watt. That's what the that's all the standards around lumens per watt. All it is is how much green and yellow we're we producing per watt. It's not how much blue or how much red. We're losing the healthy parts of light um, by this uh, by these standards. So I guess one question I have is because uh, I've heard different sort of responses in the space around like when is it a, is it ever appropriate to like have indoor lighting on so like is there is there like a net benefit because like blue during the day is generally good because like it's during the day but is because of the way leds are is there ever a time when led would be at the least side not harmful at during the day or is it better than just not use them at all no no we've been able, what we were able to do this is part of the thing is we want you know we've got a balance between our of vision course. right we want to serve vision we want to be able to see what we're reading we want to be able to maybe do a task or something that requires good visual acuity uh maybe we're building a you know a, a device whatever it is a child's doing their homework whatever it is so the challenge is how do we balance good vision and good quality light and color, you know, light, white light. And the breakthrough that we came up with as through our research was discover that violet light around um, 420 or so um, has the benefit of, and when added to other colors of light, of being able to create white light, even when there's no blue. In other words, the problem is, in a light bulb, if you take out, or an LED chip or whatever, if you take out all the blue light, you end up with a rather ghastly yellow-orangey color, right? So one solution is go for very yellow-orangey lights. Those are lights where all the blue has been taken out, all right? And you can use those. But we found that we could supplement by adding the violet and make the light white again, but with no blue, and get the benefit. So that's a whole set, and that's what we patented and uh, 
Now we've licensed to some of the major lighting companies this technology. So we can get good quality light again, but light that is not containing blue. So you don't have to abandon light or abandon LEDs. Um, and it's really a question of now we've got solutions that make this attractive enough to be viable and for people willing to use it. Because the number of people willing to live their lives in the evenings in yellow orange light is, you know, enthusiasts will do it. But, um, you know, you've got to have something to appeal to the general population. Yeah, it's uh, it's tough, I think. And and a lot of purists, I guess, like Ryan and myself, we go we go a bit extreme. But that sounds like a great solution for the daytime when violet light is available. What are solutions for early morning and then nighttime? Um, because right now, red LEDs are basically right, like just putting phosphorus over blue LEDs. They're not really red in their essence. So maybe you could talk about what are some possible solutions for nighttime or sunset yeah. time um, LEDs yeah. or lighting in general. Right. Okay. So basically, um, basic principle, what an LED is, right? An LED is a chip that converts electricity into light. They tend to be, because of the most efficient, blue emitting chips. That's the that that's the four chip. But to get the actual LED, what to get white light, you put a phosphor coating over the top of that, that light emitting chip. And what the phosphors do, and there's a whole sort of chemistry of phosphors, but the, the mixture of phosphors will take that blue and convert it to a different color. They convert some of it to red, some to green, some to yellow, et cetera, all right? And as a result, that's how you build so-called white light. So you can actually, we could solve this problem by changing the core chip used in the first place. So in our nighttime lights or our evening lights, we use chips that replace the blue chip with a violet chip. That's what I was talking about. The phosphor coating now is used to balance that light out and get the right, it's called spectral engineering. You can engineer the color spectrum um, uh, that, that we need. So the, in, the, in the daytime, I mentioned I, earlier, I mentioned that lights are too dim to have much effect. You know, you know in because if you get, if you really crank the lights up in a room, um, you get a ton of glare. And that glare is very uncomfortable. So people tend to turn the light levels into light intensity down. But what we can do is enhance the blue. One of the things I mentioned just briefly earlier was this 450 blue, which is where the classic LED, most of the LEDs in the market, 98, 99% of them are, are based on this 450 blue chip. We've, we've built them with 480 blue chips so that we can actually now move that area during the day so we can enhance that light during the daytime. At night, as I've said, we've built LEDs that take that blue out in the evening hours, um, replace it with violet, and then protect the circadian clock. So, And then, of course, you need a control system that will move from one to the other. So, yeah, you could do it with two different light bulbs, you know, or switch light bulbs. That's a bit of a pain. Um, Better to have a system, and that's what we built and installed in commercial settings with a with a timer in it that's that knows where you are, latitude and longitude, knows the season of the year, knows where it can therefore predict sunrise and sunset, and therefore as the sun goes down by the horizon, the light automatically switches to the night mode. As the sun arises in the morning, it automatically switches to the day mode. So that those types of solutions are um, um, all you know pro programmable and um, uh, either with little devices inside the clock or they're picking up signals or whatever else uh, you can however you can do it. That's really cool. I mean, that's I mean, I'm I'm all about that. That sounds like a great great option. And I actually didn't even know like some of this was being worked on. So that that almost sim like simplifies my entire existence to a degree, especially when it comes to like the rest of my family who think I'm a kook. Which, yeah. which it helps. You, I mean, here's the deal. You know, you shouldn't have to think about it, right? Oh, yeah. Like, um, so, for example, your breathing. If I talk about your breathing and you start being, and you're going to start becoming conscious of, have I breaking the breath and should I need another breath? You really screw it up, right? I mean, people start hyperventilating or whatever else and they're thinking about their breathing. Um, that is an automatic thing. In the same way, your lights should be automatic. You shouldn't have to think or worry about what time of day it is or should I be switching the lights. 
should be totally automatic. It's like an automatic, the body has its automatic systems. We don't like them, and we just get into trouble when we mess with them. The light should be automatic, and that's how we made it. So it's a no-brainer, no-thinker. You know, it's all programmed in, and that's the way to to do this thing. Because one thing I've I'm, I've been thinking about too is like we were talking about all the health ramifications of of not having um, good circadian health, and it's very. I think once you understand it, it becomes. Um, it all starts to make sense. Like I think logically, like once you can remove the noise and stuff and you really think about it, it's like, oh, it makes sense. They like sleep, wake up, light matters and all that stuff. But how do we, how do we, I, I think education is sort of like one of the biggest things for people is just lack of education or just lack of knowing. But how do we, I can just see like talking about this with people. I'm just like, how do you, how do we make it sexy? Like how do we make light sexy? Like we've made exercise Oh, I don't know, food sexy, but you you get my point. Sort of like, how do we make it attractive to people? How do we get people to care about the light right. part? Well, I mean, the bottom line is that as light is is important to your health, the light you see is important to your health. It's the food you eat, the water you drink, the air you breathe. Right? That's the basic thing. And you're absolutely right. Uh, huge emphasis on food and nutrition. In fact, I took a look at the book website of one of the leading, the top publisher in the world, a Penguin Random House. Um, on their website, there are 1,881 books about nutrition diets, right? One book about light and health. And that was written in 2013, um, before LEDs were even on the market. I mean, it's crazy. It's a total imbalance, right? So, yes, we need to bring people's awareness up, and it is quite as important. Um, and that, of course, is why I've written the book, The Light Doctor, why I invite everybody just to search for it on the, and Google it and The Light Doctor on Substack, and you'll find it. Um, and uh, that's with up-to-date information. I'm constantly updating it, a new chapter every couple of weeks. Um, and that's a way to start educating. Um, also, a training programs, developing training programs for the lighting industry and, and others. But training is the key. You know, it, it's a message that people get when you tell them, but, but most people are unaware, um, totally unaware. They don't understand that the LED lights of today are linked to breast cancer and diabetes and obesity. Uh, they don't realize that the uh, um, the decisions they're making are affecting their health. Um, you're absolutely right. And that's why I'm delighted to be on this podcast and why I'm doing these podcasts to get the word out and, you um, you know, try to use social media. But what I like to say is you have a right to healthy light, right? You have a right to healthy light. You should not be only going into the hardware store and only being able to find blue rich LEDs as the only light choice. Um, if you walk down the aisle, there are thousands of different light bulbs and so forth. Buy for your home, um, you know, the, the ones you need. But it's a supply and a demand problem. This is this is what we're battling with right now. Um, we have the inventions there, the science is there. Uh, I have 250 scientists behind me. We did a survey of 250 leading scientists. So this science is so well established because what the light industry was saying: two things. No custom consumers don't want this. They're not buying it. So why would we build it? And the science really isn't proven. So the science not being proven. I got together. Got, I got. I, I got uh, 250 of the people who've done the most work in this field of circadian rhythms and light around the world, and we did a whole consensus study, and we came up with a whole series of mo this basic science, ag agreeing that this was now well-established science. All right, that one we've dealt with. Consumers aren't buying. Well, that that issue is obviously the education issue. Consumers need to be demanding this, and people need to be knowing. You know what exposure they have. Why are you letting your your family members in hospitals be under blue rich light in the middle of the night? That's going to double the length of time they stay in there, reduce their rates of healing. Why would you ever do that? Why would you let your parents in senior living homes, you know, be under lights that are going to cause them to be more confused, have more falls, get sicker, uh, and live less uh, effective lives? You know, why would you do that? Why would you let people who are working the night shift in industry and uh, jobs around the working around the clock 
Um, why would you let them get um, 50% more cancer? You know, it, it, there's a level of outrage almost that's needed here that we've got to get this thing changed. Are you interested in 100% grass-fed, grass-finished bison meat? I'm excited to be a partner with Falls Family Ranches. Based in Wyoming, Falls Family Ranches is raising high-quality bison meat the way nature intended. As a native large ruminant of North America, bison is one of the most nutrient-dense foods you can consume. If you're interested in trying out their bison boxes, use code TRISTAN, T-R-I-S-T-A-N, 10, for 10% off your first order. Yeah, I, I think it's it's tough, really, because reversing any, I guess, industry norms, and I think you mentioned on your website or your book, you know, talk about like ANSI standards and, and things like that. It's it's going to be hard for people to just switch everything. There's a, you know, a cost to that. But if uh, there are alternatives out there, so you can't make a change if there are no alternatives. So I think it's it's really awesome that you, that you're working on this and it's really not that complicated from I mean maybe it's a it's engineering effort but it's not like it's some impossible solution to fix um by you know just going back to the the chip that's being used the the IC the integrated circuitry and I've been reading more about this as well and it seems like for screens there could be also a better solution out there um yeah. you know so what, what do you think an optimal screen looks like? Because I know Ryan and I constantly have like an orange filter on, on our screens. I don't know. To me, that seems like a, a good balance. And obviously at nighttime, we make it like very dark red or wear blue light blocking glasses. Um, how can we fix screens on phones, computers, TVs, or, or what should people be doing um, throughout the day for screen filtering? Well, that same technology I told you we developed, which uses a zero blue um, chip with or LED, with a, which has violet instead of the blue in it, right? That is safe for using at night and a blue rich day. Those can be built into screens. In fact, um, at the big uh, display.com, the display show that came on this year in Los Angeles, they were on display. Screens that automatically do the same thing. It's still a white screen, very little difference as it automatically switches from a day mode that's giving you the right blue, not the wrong blue, because I told you this blue that our chips, most of our chips is is, is not the blue you want to see to help your clock synchronize. Um, so it switches from the day mode to the night mode and does it automatically. And that technology exists. It's been shown to a lot of the big um, uh, manufacturers of display screens. And so um, it's totally, the technology is ready um, to go. And we've got to get it into mass production. But yeah, it's um, that's, the, that's the solution. And then you wouldn't have to mess around with yellow, orange screens, uh, screens or you know, putting filters on and all the rest. You know, It's like we're doing a patchwork job now. With block glassing, uh, you know, blue blocking glasses and screens on computer screens and all the rest of it, we're trying to compensate. Um, it actually isn't necessary. We just put the right technology that now is developed and proven. So, just maybe a quick controversial question on that is: Why would tech companies ever be incentivized to do this? Because right now, you know, people are staying up all night, staring at their phones. If we make their sleep cycles better, maybe they're going to be using technology less. So do you think there's like a big hurdle from adoption of tech companies? I mean, we start making everyone less sick too, you know, there'd be a lot of money lost in the uh, modern economy. So I'm, I'm curious if this is something you've thought about at all, adoption wise. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's one of the issues, right? But I think um, I actually think the bigger barrier is uh, cheapness, right? In other words, anything that's in mass production today is the cost point has come way, way down. And to get the consumer to buy something that's more expensive is is just a challenge, right? They've got to be really convinced to do that. And so I think the fact is, you know, what we've got, and we the other side of it is, We've got energy efficiency standards that are coming down from government regulations, which are focused, are totally single-mindedly focused 
on lumens per watt. And as I mentioned earlier, lumens per watt is measuring how much bright light, which is actually just the yellow and green part of the light spectrum, how much of that brightness are they producing? It doesn't measure at all about the healthiness of the light. It doesn't measure how much blue or not it's got, how much red or not it's got. But the regulations are forcing higher and higher targets. So the regulation that went into full effect on August 1 this year was every light bulb had to be at least 45 lumens per watt. Why incandescents couldn't make it, they never got better than about 15 uh, lumens per watt, and halogen wasn't much better. Um, now, the latest set of regulations, they want to push that 45 lumens per watt to 120 lumens per watt. That's going to freeze out you know, these innovative solutions that give you healthy light, because they're measuring unhealthy light and incentivizing you to um, make it as highly efficient as possible and as cheaply as possible. So we, we, you know, regulations are pushing us totally in the wrong, uh, wrong direction right now, and um, there are a lot of complaints about this. Um, but whether the Department of Energy is going to listen, because they've got this thing, we've got to just reduce energy. And I'm all for, you know, preventing of global warming and you know climate, you know, trying to do what we can with climate change and energy conservation. But my gosh, we've got far bigger health problems being created by this light solution. Now, a lot of other things you can do to, you know, I'm, you know, solar, solar wind, you know, uh, solar panels and wind farms and all that other stuff. You know, renewable energy is great, right? That's not a problem. But this stuff, you know, trying to make our lights unhealthy in order to reach an energy target is insane. And there's a far bigger impact, not only for humans, by the way, we should broaden it out to all animal species. The natural world out there is being decimated by our outdoor lighting and our blue rich or outdoor lighting. We're, we're really killing the plankton in the seas. We're, we're, we're birds aren't laying eggs, insects aren't breeding. You know, we're, we're just destroying the natural environment um, with this amount of light pollution. And people love light and the more light you go, they put their light, light up their gardens. In fact, I just read a thing by a, University of California, Berkeley um, professor saying how wonderful this was. We can just light up the world because it's now cheap and we can light everything up. Uh, and that's crazy. Um, that's the other side of it. We've got human health, but we've also got um, health of the biological uh, sphere too. Yeah, that's sort of what I've noticed just in, I mean, so many different spheres of whether it's industry or medicine or or education or whatever is we tend to myopically focus on one aspect of something, whether that's yeah. like the energy people focusing on the lumens and stuff like that, and not broadening our viewpoint of the true effect of the things we do. I, I, I think that's just kind of a human thing. I think we've just kind of always done that for something, but yeah. it, it's kind yeah. of, it's kind of reaching this apex point of like, okay, we actually yeah. need to like, look at things like this. Otherwise we're yeah. going to be in deep trouble on multiple fronts. And the way I look at it too, is like, Tristan, I, I totally, I agree with his, his point of like, that's definitely one of the, one of the stop gaps for stuff is like incentive. But then there's this other thing of like, okay, do we just like keep making people sicker and sicker? Well, that'll lower their productivity and that's bad for the economy and like all this stuff. So like, wouldn't it be incentivized to raise people's productivity by increase, by improving their health and all this stuff. But there's, there's so many different factors to this stuff. It's never just like one one issue that we're dealing with so it's one of those things where i think this education that that we're talking about here and like having you in the podcast is, is important because this is the messaging that hopefully resonates with people um unfortunately sometimes it only resonates once you get sick enough to have it resonate but hopefully it people's minds can be open enough to like oh maybe i do need to start thinking about this because i'm tired all the time and i can't figure it out that's like the biggest thing i see with people is like they're constantly tired and they don't ever make that connection to like, oh, it could be the light that I'm seeing or not seeing all day long or at night. Night's the big time one. That's why I think uh, that's why I really like that you um really put a focus on that early in the podcast because people talk about daylight all the time, but like nighttime's like a big one that people don't focus on. So how can we make these solutions, I guess... Uh, how? What are things you're working on in in the manufacturing space to make these solutions more available and like being produced and stuff? Like, are the are they are they being produced right now? Or are you in the works for that? 
or how's that process going on your end? Because you've you've kind of gotten the science component getting there, but how do we get it kind of moving into being sold? Right. Well, one thing that we did, we licensed this technology that we invented. Um, we got the patents and so forth on it. We licensed it to some of the leading lighting companies who are now starting to come out with lights um, and uh, their announcements coming out this fall. Um, and there already are, you can buy zero blue light bulbs. That they're available, the static ones, but that's moving towards these automatically changing bulbs. So those, are, those are coming out shortly. Uh, light bulbs for indoor offices and the like, uh, light fixtures uh, with this technology in. In other words, you want something that will automatically change the light content, the blueness, uh, the circadian blue part, the sky blue part, um, by across day and night. So those are coming online. And part of my my whole uh, light doctor um, substack uh, posting is to really keep the breast, uh, everybody abreast of this technology as it comes out and where it is and how it's available um, and what the various solutions are. Um, you know, there are three different solutions to, by the way, at nighttime to, or, you know, one is just dim the lights way down, right? Because there's less blue, you know, blue percent is multiplied by the total amount of intensity of all white light, right? So how much blue times that? So you can just bring down the light intensity way down, dim, it'd be in the dim light. That has its disadvantages, obviously. Um, or you can change the color temperature of the light, but you have to move it down till you get right down to about 1800 Kelvin, which is very yellow orange light. But you can do that with, with the standard LEDs. Or you use these spectrally engineered LEDs where you don't have to change the light intensity, just the blue content is being changed. So they move from 20% blue during the day to less than 2% blue during the nighttime hours. Um, say, you know, with these things. Those solutions are all coming available. And, you know, part of, you know, uh, why I encourage everybody to sign up for the Light Doctor on Substack um, is that's going to be the, the core information. The book provides the core story, um, provides the evidence, um, and it's all referenced and documented from the science, but it's written in a user-friendly way. I've written it for, you know, just general the general public. Um, and that, in turn, is going to keep you aware of what the solutions are, where they are, how to find them, um, and that's the story. We've got to get the word out and get people really not only doing it, but demanding it. And the demanding is quite important because the lighting industry will be more motivated the more people are asking for it. So in a sense, um, we've got to deal with that. One side of it is you know, regulatory things. Um, uh, one interesting thing as we went to our panel of 250 scientists, one thing they agreed on is that your standard LED lights that you buy in the hardware and so forth in the hardware store should have a label on them, say, maybe unhealthy if used at night, right? Imagine that, a label that, you know, it's like a label in a cigarette package, right? Um, so uh, that's one type of thing. Uh, some places uh, out in Hawaii, they passed an ordinance recently that basically said any outdoor lights had to have less than 2% blue content, right? That again. Nantucket Island of Massachusetts just passed an ordinance that all lights must be 2,700 Kelvin or less. You know, these sort of things are happening. So at the local level, and actually some way that changes can be made at the local level, because if a lighting manufacturer can't sell to California or wherever, um, that's how things get changed, right? In other words, um, uh, why is the iPhone now um, for changing its plug, right? It's because the European Union decided that it was only the USB-C's plugs that were going to be allowed, you know, and and so you want, and that's just European, but they don't want to build something for different things around the world, so they changed the plug for all the iPhones and the iPhone 15. That's you know. That type of stuff. So local movements can make a difference in making it, um, you know, uh, that you can't put lights in that actually are unhealthy. And that's what we need to be moving ourselves towards. But the book, The Light Doctor, is really trying to lay the whole evidence case out so it's something that anybody can use as a reference and use to make the argument and use to support 
um, and use the campaign to get people on board and aware of this. Yeah, I think I think that's the key. I think leading by example as well and, and educating is key. So I'm curious in general, what are some you know easy things that that the everyday person can do to improve their light environment? I guess in the meantime, until you know things are more commercially available that are better solutions. I guess right now what I do is, you know, I try and just get as much natural light as, as possible. I try and go out, I watch the sunrise. I go outside, even if it's like five minutes, like during the day, like say you work in an office, I think that's very impactful. Um, what are things that you do and what are things that are very easy for people to do to improve their light environment today? Well, first of all, um, getting outside, as you say, is important. And that's the most natural way and most effective way to do it. You can also supplement um, the light indoors. Our light indoor tends to be rather dim um, as compared to the outside world. And um, even in a room with windows, there isn't enough blue of that critical healthy blue coming in. And so there are devices you can buy that can supplement the amount of blue you're getting. Um, and those devices will give you sort of boost up the blue part of the spectrum. And they can help you during the daytime hours. Um, during the as you get into the evening hours, um, certainly doing um, uh, you know changing the color of the lights or looking for light these light bulbs that don't have looking for zero blue light bulbs effectively is what you're looking for. The real measure is about less than two percent blue is the good guide. So anything that gives you less than two percent blue. And there are solutions, everything from you know orange lights and red lights and all sorts of things. But as I say, we're now moving to a thing where we don't have to compromise to that and can offer white lights. So those those are all coming. But as I say, you know, stay tuned to the Light Doctor channel, and you know you'll be right up to date with where these products are and how to find them and and so forth. And then the other side of it is the blue blocking glasses. Most blue blocking glasses are useless. They're blocking the wrong blue, by the way. And that's, I told you earlier that blue is such a general statement. Some people call blue everything from 400 to 500 nanometers. And some blue blocking glasses are only blocking light down at 420, 430. They're not, not doing anything for the circadian effective blue. So there's a huge standard there that we need to, you know, we need to have a critical view of, um, you know, what is blue blocking? I mean, for example, one of the big, um, largest uh, um, eyewear companies in the world, you know, sells um, branded products uh, that give you this blue glint to the glasses. Well, you know, this is a blue thing we're adding. That reduces the amount of blue down at the wrong part of the spectrum by only 20%. You know, it's a, it's, it's a sort of a trivial effect, um, you know, and but they make a ton of money selling this this blue you know, this blue filtering uh, feature. No, that's actually a really good point because there's like so much discussion around that too. And there's like all sorts of blue blocking glasses. There's like the ones that are clear. There's ones that you get from your optometrist when you go in and you can have them put a blue blocking tint on. And there's not really like a standard uniform uh, right. thing. And so it's like, also, I was, I was sort of curious, like, so with, along with that, it's like when you wear, cause I need glasses to see, so I don't really drive without glasses cause that would be a fatal mistake. But, um, when you wear glasses outside, does that, should you be taking your glasses off? Cause like, I've always had that rule of thumb is like, okay, unless it's like something like I'm operating heavy machinery or something and I need to see, I'm kind of outside just getting the full spectrum in my eyes. Is that more beneficial? Or because I've always been told that like it changes the way light enters my eye wearing like like you're wearing glasses right now. Would you take them off outside or is it not that big a deal? No, I mean, number one, I wouldn't for safety because I'd end up tripping over something when I'm walking. Fair enough. Right. Um, uh, or driving, it wouldn't be too safe. Um, and, and also illegal since I've got a, you know, my, my driver's That's license, so I have to wear glasses. Good point. Uh, the answer is, the change of light for spectrum is minimal, absolutely minimal from these. All right. Even if I had a little blue blocking, it's as a best as 20%. Um, so that is minimal. What you are looking at is, and you do want to now you can wear dark sunglasses um, and they can reduce a lot of light. Um, 
But as I say, if you're going out in the mornings to get light, I wouldn't wear dark sunglasses at that time because you want to get the maximum benefit from it. Uh, but when the light is very bright and there's a lot of glare, absolutely, the light light glasses are going to be um, uh, dark sunglasses are just fine because the amount of ex- light is so much greater outside than it is indoors. What you don't want to do is wear blue blocking glasses indoors. It doesn't make any sense, you know, except in the evening hours. Um, and and even then, it needs to be glasses. Glasses that are clear, just by definition, are not doing anything to block the circadian blue effect, which is interfering with your melatonin and your circadian clocks. Those glasses have to look quite orangey to be effective at all. Yeah, I think that's that's what Ryan and I figured it's really, I used to have like blue light blocking glasses five years ago when they were first coming out. I had a concussion and they were almost clear, like very yellow tinted. And now yeah. I realize they pretty much don't do anything um, besides yeah. maybe yeah. help with glare a little bit. Yeah. So now we yeah. have the dark red ones and I think they're good if you can't, you know, can't avoid anything, but it's better to turn your your lights off at night. And, and the sunglasses piece has become a popular um, point um as well so i think it's important especially if yeah like you you emphasize the importance of morning light and yeah if you're if you're just standing there in the morning you know watching the sunrise yeah don't you don't need to wear sunglasses right um but if you're moving running driving skiing whatever that you know that's a different story um yeah so there's always a trade-off between your vision right and your visual acuity what you need for your own safety and uh, between how much of the blue dose that you're getting. And you've got to play a wide straight off there. Yeah, definitely. Well, this is exciting. I'm glad we finally got to dive into a light specific podcast. Um, Dr. Martin Mori, thanks for coming on. Where can people find more of you? You mentioned the light doctor. That's the book. It's only on Substack, So we'll have to link your Substack. Is there any, yeah. Where can people find your research, your published articles, and anything else, website, whatever you'd like to share. Yeah, the uh, the white my website is thelightdoctor.com, and that has access to videos and other materials. I've also got Instagram and um, you know YouTube and other other social media, LinkedIn, of course. Um, so those those channels you can you can have uh, you know the Instagram is gives you little short little snippets of things. Um, and uh, so that that will and people want something you can spread or, or spread the word around. Um, but the lightdoctor.com is the website and uh, searching on Google uh, for the light doctor at on Substack, you'll get immediately directly to my book. Uh, we've got a free sign up for your subscription. Um, you can look at chapters and everything for free. Um, and then uh, uh, there is also a paid section where, if you want full access to all the data and so forth. But that's the place to go. And um, I'm publishing it. It's right up to date, um, constantly updated with the latest information. And so that's the best way to follow it. And uh, as I say, we've got to start a bit of a movement um, uh, demanding that we have the right to, uh, to healthy light. Um, we've got to uh, you know, campaign to get our workplaces, our employers, uh, to get our hospitals, to get our senior living, to get our schools, um, you know, properly equipped with healthy light, uh, as well as our homes. Absolutely. And that's why it's so exciting you're developing these lighting solutions. So I'm really excited to see when that comes out fully. Is there ever going to be a physical copy of the book as well for us who love the physical books? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that's the first step. First step is getting out on Substack. And then, as I say, next year, um, I will have a physical copy. You know, um, Awesome. That's, that's under discussion. Yep. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. And Dr. Maureen, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. We'll see you next time.